The province of Quebec is looking into issuing fines for those who are unvaccinated. Will Alberta go down a similar path? Premier Jason Kenney has said in the past that getting the COVID-19 vaccine will not become mandatory in our province, but also recall a time when there, we weren't supposed to have any of those vaccine passports either. To discuss this in more detail as Lethbridge East MLA Nathan Nordorf joins us now via Zoom. Nathan, would Alberta maybe potentially follow Quebec's lead and look at maybe bringing in a tax for the unvaxxed? What are your thoughts? Uh, absolutely not, Hal. That is not uh, the people of Alberta in any way, shape or form. And I think we're actually much closer to moving towards a more productive and unifying kind of stage of this pandemic towards that endemic stage. And we're really looking forward to shifting the conversation towards the immune versus the, the non-immune or those who are at, still at risk versus those who are not at risk. So we're really trying to, to get towards the end path here. And uh, I don't think that's a, 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 an avenue that we're going to go in any way, shape or form. Some of the supporters for the tax for the unvax saying, well, you can use the funds to support the health care system. I guess that's why some people were actually behind it, behind the cause there. Nathan, students kindergarten through grade 12 are back in school. Many parents are celebrating that fact and a lot of kids are pretty happy about it. Now, you've spoken to many parents in our region. How important was it for the mental health of the kids and maybe the parents for the students to be back to in-person learning? It was very important how, while parents would still have concerns, as many people do about the, uh, the pandemic, air quality, cleanliness, uh, safety precautions, those kinds of things, parents generally and in the vast majority realize that in-person learning is the best kind of learning for their children. And they really want to see those kids get back in the classroom and to as normal a life as they can. So that was really important. And by far, the majority are very supportive of going to back to in-class learning. Now, due to the rising demand uh, PCR tests, Nathan, Alberta changed its eligibility as to who can gain access to them. Let's talk about who really is eligible right now. Sure. It's really meant to be focused on those who are at, have a high clinical risk uh, factor of, of a severe outcome. So those who live and work in high-risk settings, those who are in continued care or in frontline healthcare uh, positions, we really want to make sure that those are the ones with the greatest access to those PCR tests. We just don't have the availability to test everybody who's positive right now. That's one of the, the trends of this Omicron virus is many, many people get it, even though they would experience mostly experience very low and mild symptoms. So we really have to allocate our resources in the most effective areas possible. And now news coming out of Cyprus that there's actually a hybrid virus or variant of it called the Delta Cron, you know, Delta and the Omicron. So remains to be seen. Have you heard of any of those cases that made their way to our province? Uh, I haven't heard that any have made their way to the province. Uh, I have heard about it. There is some information from uh, Dr. Hinshaw and her staff that that wave may have started prior to Omicron, but because of the transmiss transmissibility of Omicron, it has already uh, overcome that. But we'll have to wait and see, and we will we'll be continuing to watch that closely. Nathan, Canada's Environment Minister Stephen Guibault says he wants to eliminate our country's oil and gas sector within two years. I mean, that's the bread and butter of the Alberta economy. How is that even possible, and why would you want to threaten an industry which provides billions of dollars and creates thousands of jobs? It's not possible, Hal. And, and frankly, to be honest, it's ridiculous to suggest. Virtually every home in Canada is heated by oil and gas or electricity produced from oil and gas and its derivatives. So not, not only would we, we freeze out many, many people in Quebec alone last year, there was that rail derailment and there were many seniors in particular and many homes in Quebec that were at risk of freezing and freezing to death because of lack of oil and gas. This is just not a practical suggestion to make. It's not helpful. And that's without considering the hundreds of thousands of jobs that would be lost, the billions of dollars of revenue. Quite frankly, to even suggest it uh, creates more uncertainty. To actually do it could quite literally bankrupt not just Alberta, but the entire country. And I, I think that the minister really needs to take a new look at his role and his responsibility and uh, maybe look at some real possibilities instead of suggesting things like this. What kind of financial footing do you think Alberta's on right now? I guess we got nowhere to go but up following the pandemic, the recession we were in, but oil is now over $80 US a barrel. Are we in pretty good financial shape heading through 2022? Well, we're definitely in a better position than we were, and I think this underlines the, the challenges that Alberta has always faced with the oil and gas 
uh, sector and the ups and downs of a resource market. Uh, we are, are still very much looking at making sure that our spending is appropriate to our income, but we're definitely trending in a very positive direction, and I hope to see some very good numbers when the budget is introduced later in February. I chatted with Jobs Minister Doug Schweitzer recently, had him on the show, and he talked about the 130,000 jobs over the past year making their way to Alberta here. Where do you see a lot of industries really thriving outside of the oil and gas sector now that oil is rebounded? Sure, there's, there's lots of sectors that are doing very, very well. Uh, we see our STEM and research, our film industries, our financial and financial technologies industry. Uh, we hope that this year we'll see a, a strong rebound for our tourism. Uh, our agricultural uh, industry has been steady throughout. And construction is definitely on the rise, not just in the province, but also here in Lethbridge. So a lot of bright spots that will continue to grow as we come out of the winter season and into spring and summer, and very much looking forward to that. Now let's talk agriculture for just a moment here, since it's a really big part of our economy here in southwestern Alberta. The province recently announced that livestock producers and beekeepers can apply for more funding for those hit with severe drought conditions last summer. How much funding are we talking about through this Canada-Alberta Livestock Feed Assistance Agri-Recovery Initiative? In total, the, the province and the federal government together have come up with $340 million of supportive funding for those who were really negatively impact, impacted by the drought last year. Uh, farmers and ranchers, in terms of the uh, uh, cattle uh, industry in particular, would be able to uh, apply for up to $200 a head. Uh, and that deadline is January 31st. I'm not quite sure how that translates to, to beekeepers. I don't know if they get uh, funding by head, the head or if their funding is uh, more lump sum in nature, but they would also be eligible for some supports. Let's circle back to jobs for just a moment here, Nathan. Now, like we mentioned earlier, Alberta added 130,000 new jobs, but unfortunately in our region, the unemployment rate actually went up from 4.8 to 5.2%. What more can the province do to ensure that people here in Lethbridge and southwestern Alberta are working? Sure, and I just want to create a little bit of context. 4.8 to 5.2 is still extremely low in terms of unemployment. I mean, if you get into the threes and fours, that's almost unsustainably low. So 5.2 is still rather healthy. It's a, it's a good number to be at. But I think it's actually, when you go a little bit deeper into it, it's an indication that our economy is actually expanding. More jobs are coming onto the market and more people are looking for those jobs. Both are positive indicators, even though that unemployment number has crept up. I think uh, Lethbridge in Alberta is still the second lowest of unemployment in the entire province. So we're in a very, very good place. I think though, we don't wanna see those unemployment numbers rise. I think we're in a period of transition and they actually speak of better things coming. There's a lot of employers in Lethbridge and area that are looking for people to come to work. So as those people re-enter the market, they enter the market as unemployed, but they will be, once they get a job, they will become gainfully employed. And I think we're seeing a good trend overall, even though we've had a slight dip, which is not uncommon during the winter season. Our province's Associate Minister of Status of Women says Alberta leads Canada with a 60.6% employment rate. What kind of opportunities can women find here in our province compared to other provinces throughout the country? Well, that's one of the great diversities of Alberta. There are so many opportunities for women and all those looking for jobs. We, we've really put a focus on STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics for women through the programs of high school and post-secondary. Uh, there are many research firms moving to Alberta. There's new energy opportunities in hydrogen and that kind of thing. There's, uh, as we said before, industries like film, financial, financial tech, tourism, agriculture, construction, all looking for more uh, workers, all have significant opportunities for women. We are moving in a very good direction and very proud for Alberta to lead the country in women's employment. Nathan, many political parties' popularity have taken a big hit during the pandemic. The UCP is no exception. What will it take for your party to rebuild its image, especially in our region, leading up to the next provincial election in 2023? I think in a word, how I would put it as service and meaningful service to the constituents across the province, helping them get back to the lives that they had before the pandemic. This pandemic has disrupted everyone, as you just noted, particularly governments. 
but I'm, I'm very pleased to represent Lethbridge, Lethbridge East and see roles like my new appointment to, as parliamentary secretary and water stewardship for the Minister of Environment. Water is a very important issue for, for us down in the south. To be able to have that voice at that table, I would hope shows uh, Lethbridgeites that, that I'm serving their needs. Uh, I've recently been appointed to the Priorities Implementation Cabinet Committee to help make decisions on opening our economy again while facing the COVID pandemic. Again, Lethbridge's voice at a table making significant decisions. I was elected by all of the colleagues of the legislature as the MLA of the year this year. I'm very honored to do, to do that. But as recognition of all elected officials, again, serving my constituents, making sure their voice is heard at meetings and committees in the legislature. And then other things like look at the work at the airport. That's very meaningful people for me, meaningful for people in Lethbridge. Our exhibition grounds, that building coming along, an agricultural uh, opportunity, tourism opportunity. We've got the new school on the west side that should be uh, breaking ground this year. Things of that nature. I think that service to the constituents will, will be what it takes to show Albertans that we've heard them, we've heard their needs, and we're doing everything possible to meet those needs. Where is the province really at fiscally, though, and what will that mean for Lethbridge moving forward? Would maybe the province potentially look at helping the city build a third bridge? We'll have to see exactly what happens with that, Hal. It's not yet, in, in my understanding, been formulated into a formal ask of the city to the province. But I'm proud in the last two and a half years, the previous uh, administration had five major asks. We have uh, funded all five of those major asks for the city of Lethbridge. That's Exhibition Park, that's the airport, that's the twinning of Highway 3, that's uh, some significant deferred maintenance at the university, and it's broadband. So I've been very proud to work with the city of Lethbridge, achieve their goals in a timely fashion. And uh, if the third bridge is on the list in mean, the upcoming administration, we'll have to work on that too. But so far we've been, we've been batting a thousand now, Hal. Our city, like many others across Canada, is still dealing with an opioid crisis. The Lethbridge Overdose Prevention Society and Mom Stop the Harm want to see a more permanent solution when it comes to helping those seeking treatment for their drug addictions. Now, outside of the mobile supervised injection site that we have here, what else is really in the works to help those who want the help? Sure, Al. I think it's a very important topic and issue, uh, particularly for Lethbridge. That's why our government has invested in and announced almost $15 million of supports for treatment beds, for ongoing operations, for long-term services and treatments. It does take some time to build those beds. I am very excited about the potential of a sod turning for the new supportive beds here in Lethbridge in the very near future. Uh, but we're all a little impatient for those services to actually be more available for those who need them. So we've got a little bit more time to go, but again, as we come out of winter into spring, as those building activities pick up, we'll actually be able to start seeing those buildings get built, those beds be in place, those, those service workers manning those beds, and that will make a major change. And I look forward to that, to really meeting the needs in an ongoing, long-term kind of basis to, again, help those who want to get out of addictions onto a better path. We're getting there, but it does take some time. Nathan, the opposition NDP has said the reason why we're not attracting a lot of doctors here to our region is just they, they basically Google, you know, crime stats, different cities, different communities across the province, and Lethbridge comes up quite high and it scares some people from actually moving here to our city. What can we do to really change that mindset and attract more physicians, which are sorely needed here in our region? Absolutely. I think we need to talk about all the good things that are happening instead of just focusing on the bad. Uh, and in fact, our new police chief and the work that he's done in every single sector of the city, he has seen with his, his new uh, administrative process, crime levels go down. So the trend is in the right way. He continues to work incredibly hard. So I applaud our police service for all the efforts, despite the scrutiny they've been under. They've done a great job and continue to correct uh, failings of the past. They're moving in a good direction. And again, we need to talk about the things that are going well, not just the things that we continue need to need to work on, which are true, and, and we are trying to address those, but we've got a lot going for us. We have a very stable uh, agricultural ec economy, food and food product, food services. We're increasing our trade to the states. Our construction and ho housing industry has seen some of the best numbers in quite some time. We've got lots of manufacturing as well. 
things are going much better, and trending much better, and I just continue hope to can, that rise continues for the betterment of Lethbridge, and that. I think coupled with a very good standard of living and a low cost of living should attract doctors as we move forward uh, on, on that trajectory as well. Lethbridge East, MLA Nathan Newdorf, thanks so much for your time today. You bet. Thank you, Hal.